Good afternoon. My name is Prasoon Devan. And as you can see, I have many co-authors. So it's only appropriate that our title also is of matching length. Here, I've decomposed the title into its various parts. And I'll talk about these parts in sequence. And to illustrate these parts, I'll use a running example, which is the problem of finding all the odd numbers in a sequence of random numbers. And of course, this is a highly parallelizable problem. So this work is, of course, about training. So we have a trainer or instructor who gives a set of problem requirements to a bunch of trainees or students. And the code they produce can then be processed by automating checks that are problem specific. So they work from problem requirements. And the feedback they produce can then be used to uh, automatically determine uh, how well the requirements were met. And such automation is, of course, important to create scalable courses. And it's also important for short duration training sessions when you don't have enough time to grade the uh, student work. Now, these checks can be run not only by the instructor, but also by the students themselves to get feedback before submitting the code for final grading. And they can then use the feedback to iteratively improve the solution. So the checks can act like an instructor agent that is clarifying requirements to the students, telling them if they're on the right track, indicating what's missing or what's wrong, and maybe even helping them get on the right track if they need to be uh, corrected. So while the students are doing work, if you're like me, you want to know what's going on. You want to know whether the problem is too easy, whether it's too hard, or whether it's harder for some students compared to others. So what you want is, uh, and this work is unseen, and what you want is an awareness or uh, of an abstraction of the work so that you can act appropriately. In our vision, that's supported by the checks producing logs that are processed by an awareness engine that gives the feedback that hopefully the instructor wants. And the instructor can then uh, use this feedback as they feel. They can uh, clarify the assignment. They can change the assignment for next time. Or uh, if they find some students are struggling, uh, provide uh, unsolicited help to them. So the idea of automating checks is, of course, not new. Uh, the, the typical approach is to take the program, run it with some uh, given input, uh, collect the output, and the feed the input and output to a program that checks if the expected output is the same as the actual output. And based on the relationship between input and output, give appropriate feedback. And many of you have probably used this approach for um, grading serial programs. However, this approach doesn't work if your goal is to paralyze a program to improve its performance. And the reason is, whether the result is computed by one thread or multiple threads, it doesn't change. So we can't quite use a problem-specific uh, input result code later. So our solution is to have the program produce a trace of the algorithm it followed to compute the result. And this trace shows how this might work. Here we see some partial results that I'll go and explain later. And we see all of them being output by a single thread. Okay. So this, this, th this program doesn't meet our concurrency requirement. In this case, however, we do have the trace being produced by multiple threads. Okay. So now we go from an input-output correlator to an input-trace correlator. And writing such a correlator seems difficult. A, the, a trace is more complicated than a result. And B, it's non-deterministic. How threads interleave their outputs is uh, not fixed. So we can reduce this problem by creating common abstractions for implementing tests for a general class of algorithms. And the class we've chosen is folk join, because almost all EDU HPC algorithms are folk join. Now, we all have a good sense of what folk join means, but to create a testing infrastructure based around this model, we need a detailed uh, operational model of folk join algorithms. 
So here's a model that worked for us. It assumes that there's a root thread that spawns uh, a bunch of uh, child threads. And the root thread is a dispatcher thread. It doesn't do the real work, which is done by the child threads. Okay? Before it spawns these threads, it takes a sequence f of pre fork steps. And each child thread i takes a sequence bi of iteration steps. And before these steps, it does some a sequence A of pre-iteration steps, and then a sequence C of post-iteration steps. The root thread waits for all of these children to die, at which point it joins the threads and executes a sequence J of post-join steps. Okay. Now, each step accesses the value of some conceptual variable or property uh, and this variable may not exist directly in the solution. Okay. So uh, this shows you what uh, these properties may look like uh, for our example problem. So in each iteration, uh, a child thread prints the index of the input element is processing, the actual random number at that element, uh, and it determines whether the number is odd or not and prints, uh, prints the result. Okay. And that's what you see in this output. Now, different uh, problems, of course, will have different uh, values for all these steps. But given a problem, all solutions are supposed to uh, follow these steps, follow the same set of steps. So uh, given that assumption, we can build a common set of checks to see whether these solutions uh, are actual solutions or erroneous. Using this model, we've created an infrastructure that allows a problem-specific uh, test to specify the values of all of these parameters, plus callbacks that are invoked when uh, a state change trace is found in the, uh, in the output. And different uh, problems will, of course, have different values for these parameters. And the infrastructure does the difficult task of passing the non-deterministic uh, uh, output uh, matching property change sequences in different phases and invoking these uh, state change callbacks um, and then, of course, logging the actions. This piece of code shows uh, what a problem-specific uh, check might look like. Uh, this is for the example problem, uh, the odd number detection problem, and it tells us what uh, the iteration phase looks like. So there are three properties relevant here. Uh, index and number of type uh, integer and is out of type boolean. And this particular callback is called each time a new triple is found uh, in the trace. Okay. And uh, the, the, each property with its value is put in a hash table. And from this hash table, this particular method can determine the actual number. And based on that number, compute the expected result and compare that with the actual result and based on the comparison, give an error message, if necessary. Okay. And here we see the check in use. Uh, to execute a check, the uh, user uh, goes and clicks on it in a visual display of the check names. And you get output both um, in the visual user interface and the console. And we see here that the pre-fork output was correct, but the post-fork output was not correct. Okay, so we get partial credit as a result. So the fork join model as described can be implemented in multiple languages and more important can be implemented declaratively in an open MP style or procedurally by using the threat abstractions directly. Here's an example of uh, the declarative style using uh, pajama. Uh, an annotation is given to specify the concurrency requirements, and this annotation is processed by a preprocessor that uh, uses the underlying threads directly uh, to implement the specification. And the advantage, of course, here is that it's high level, but there are some disadvantages too. So there's a trade off involved. Um, parameterization reduces flexibility compared to using the thread abstraction directly. Uh, this generated code is magic. If the trainees are capable of creating this thread directly, then they will know better what's going on underneath. Okay? 
And since this code is not written by us, we can't debug it. Okay, so that's a problem. And because of these disadvantages, our current testing framework um, addresses direct use of threats. And even though this is a lower level approach, it's not really so bad because how to use how to implement fork join using threads directly is uh, follows a formula. You create some runnables, you create and start threads, and you join threads. Okay? And we've written source checks to actually help uh, reveal the formula. Okay? So there's a bunch of these checks, and I'll just identify the two that failed here. And one of them says that, look, you didn't call thread start. Okay? And uh, thread is a known abstraction, so we can detect if a start call has been made on, or not. And the second one says you didn't uh, call thread join. And similarly, we have checks to determine if you create a runnable or not, and other aspects of uh, the, uh, implementing the fork join model uh, using threads directly. Okay. And uh, you know, I hope I can convince you through this code that this this is quite readable. And it's also visualizing. Okay. So we can use a debugger uh, and put a breakpoint to see the actual threads uh, through their stacks shown by the debugger. Okay, so we get a concrete feeling that there are five threads here, four of them worker threads, and one of them uh, the dispatching thread. Okay. And of course, if you can put breakpoints, that makes a code debuggable also. So what I've done so far is describe the technical aspects of our work, uh, which is a, a checks infrastructure built around a formalization of the intuitive uh, fork join concept. And the two other contributions are a pedagogical model um, that is built around this technical model and the use of these two models uh, to train uh, trainees who will eventually become trainers themselves. Okay. So uh, I'm going to describe these two aspects next. So a pedagogical uh, model assumes hands-on programming. So students implement one or more programming exercises. And they do so with the help of uh, teaching assistants. And given that uh, we want the trainees to be able to run checks on their own, how to run them is an added complication for which we uh, uh, might need uh, assistance help. Okay. However, uh, we do not assume that the trainees see live or recorded lectures. Instead, they manipulate uh, worked examples that have comments to indicate how to experiment with the code, uh, view the results through tests to unravel concepts. Okay. How this all works is overviewed a little bit in the paper. What I want to say here is that uh, this approach is particularly important for scalable training of instructors, as such training is typically given by leaders of PDC education, and there's only so many of them, and each of them has only so much time uh, to come to conferences like this and impart such training. Let me use a few slides to illustrate a pedagogical model. As I mentioned, this model involves manipulating a worked example. And this example contains both a serial and a parallel execution of the algorithm to detect odd numbers. The parallel execution is commented out. So what they initially have is a serial execution. And the checks uh, mostly fail. Uh, the checks that determine if the input and output correlate succeed, but all the other checks um, that, that have to do with concurrency um, fail. So the first instruction, of course, is to swap the serial execution with the concurrent execution. And this time, the checks tell a different story. Uh, the number of fork threads, the pre-fork events, the number of iterations each thread makes is all correct. What is not correct is the fact that there was no interleaving uh, of the fork threads. Okay. So uh, two questions at this point are why more success and why not complete success? To understand why more success, the trainees are encouraged to look at the uh, method they just commented in. Plus they're given an explanation of the underlying concepts, which include the predefined threat class, asynchronous execution of a procedure that it supports by creating a new stack. 
And this is the kind of information that you would normally see in a live lecture or recorded lecture. And here you see it in context within the hands-on exercise. To help them understand the interleaving problem, they are steered towards uh, the predefined method create start threads. This method, uh, in each iteration, instantiates a new thread, starts it, and then sleeps for a while. And this sleep time is enough to allow the previous thread to finish before this new thread, uh, before the next thread is uh, created and started. Okay. So that's why we don't see interleaving. And they are asked to comment out the sleep call. And uh, when they do so, the uh, interleaving problem is eliminated. Okay, so they understand experimentally uh, how to get rid of the interleaving problem and what interleaving really means. Introducing interleaving brings us to the next problem in the story, which is the fact that there's a method called add odd number that is shared by multiple threads. And when these threads are active at the same time, they're interleaving, then there's a possibility of race conditions. So the race conditions are explained to them in text. They're asked to comment out the synchronized keyword to get rid of them. Plus what the synchronized method does is also explained to them in some depth. Okay. So hopefully these slides give you a flavor of the uh, lecture-less test-driven uh, in-context experimental approach to learning uh, our pedagogical model supports. So this summer, uh, we experimented with this pedagogical model and indirectly the underlying technical model also. Uh, 14 professors from across the country uh, traveled to Tennessee Tech University with their travel and stipend covered by NSF. Uh, the word example was to find odd numbers concurrently and the exercise was to find prime numbers concurrently. Their work was not graded. So to get data about our experiment, we uh, anonymously lo logged all test executions on the IBM cloud. And this work was done in a 90 minute uh, session, which was recorded on Zoom. Okay. And the track data was visualized to get in, uh, the results of our experiment. So to interpret our test results, we need to understand the test workflow supported by a system. Okay. So a programmer can edit and run their code one or more times. At some point, they're ready to test, so they run a special testing program that creates this user interface that allows them to click on a test to see its results. They can run some sequence of tests, terminate the program, and at this point, they can stop if they're satisfied or go through this process one more time. So the tests executed in the ith execution of the testing program are grouped into the ith session. So we basically partition test executions into sessions. You can have zero sessions. So you can simply uh, edit the code, run it a few times, and then stop without giving us any test data. Or you can uh, run, go through this process once or multiple times. Here's a visualization we've created from our session-based test logs. Each point represents a session. X-axis, the session time. Y axis the participant involved, and these are anonymized names. We divide the sessions into categories green, the first session, red, the last session. They were given a worked example that was incomplete and had instructions on how to complete it. And the blue dot represents uh, the session in which all tests for that worked example passed. They were also given a problem of uh, creating. Uh, a solution to the primes problem concurrently, uh, and this time without instructions. And a purple dot represents a session in which all tests for that particular problem passed. Okay. The size of the dot represents how many tests were run uh, in the session. Okay. So a small dot represents a few tests, a uh, bigger dot represents more tests. So there's some inferences we can make uh, based on this visualization. One is that there are very few purple dots, one, two, and three. So the most obvious uh, inference here is that 90 minutes was not enough to both uh, complete the worked example and do the exercise on their own. And this could also be explained by different motivation. Okay? Some people might not have been motivated to go beyond uh, the worked example. We also see uh, 
different patterns in different rows. Okay, so here's a person who took a long time but did not reach a purple dot. Here's somebody who took lesser time. And here's a person who just ran one test uh, session and, and uh, stopped. So there's substantial differences in time spent, milestones achieved, and also the testing strategies used. So here's a person who reached a blue dot without having many gray dots. And here's a person who reached a blue dot with many gray dots. Okay. So they ran a lot of intermediate sessions in which uh, uh, tests were run. And these differences can be explained by differences in faculty background and also motivation. And we suspect that both background and motivation uh, are more varied among faculty members than students in a particular course in a particular class. So the previous visualization was created from our log data. This is created from our Zoom recording. Each point represents a question. X-axis, the question time. The participants worked in groups. So the Y-axis represents uh, the group that asked the question. And we have colors to represent uh, different kinds of questions. So. Uh, some questions were addressed within the group, so that's intra-group collaboration. Some questions had to do with uh, how to get rid of errors. There were setup issues, as you can imagine, because we had this testing infrastructure. Um, plus, they had to go and uh, run the Java compiler. Um, there were instructions in our, uh, the handout we gave. Remember, this was lecture less. So, as you can expect, there was confusion about the instructions. And we also see this, this purple dot, and we see many purple dots that had to do with questions about uh, Java interfaces. And uh, this can be explained by the fact that many participants had said that they had limited exposure to Java. Uh, they had mostly worked to C++, which doesn't have interfaces. So again, this shows how varied the background was among the participants. It also shows the need for having a TA to address these kind of questions. And also indicates that we need better instructions so that uh, people have uh, fewer setup issues and confusion about instructions. And also, uh, we could have uh, more explanation about the kind of errors they might get. Okay. So this shows us how we can improve our, our uh, pedagogical model. So time for our conclusions. Our technical contribution is a formalization of folk join and a checks infrastructure built around this formalization. Our uh, pedagogical contribution is an instructor light model that is lectureless. And our experience finding is that there's much diversity in motivation, background, and performance of faculty members who might uh, take a training course in uh, PDC, parallel distributed computing. So as far as we know, we're the first ones to address training of trainers. And of course, we hypothesize that their training is fundamentally different from the training of uh, students, okay, who can be expected to have more uniformity because they're at a particular university in a particular class. It'll be good to test that hypothesis. Okay? So it'll be good to run the same experiment, this time using students. So if you have students familiar with basic Java and who would like to learn concurrency using a material, then the test logs that we have can provide a wealth of data about learning strategies used by different students and by students and faculty members. Okay. Here's my email if you want to uh, uh, contact me about this direction. And uh, our future work also includes track tests for Pajama, which is OpenMP implementation in Java, uh, OpenMP uh, implementation C, uh, CP threads directly, and Python. And that's the end. Time for questions.